Yeah. Hello there. This is John Randall here. I can see everybody else. I don't know if they can see or hear me. Uh, oh, I can hear something. Um, look as if we're live. A bit glitchy. Uh, I think that's the uh, that's the technology of today. Um, so, so, in that case, let's. So uh, let's kick off. I'm John Rental. I work for the uh, Independent, um, and I, I am chairing this, this uh, for Bright Blue, sponsored by Bell Benkian Foundation. Um, and we have a star-studded lineup, who you can see before you. Um, Bright Blue is an independent uh, think tank, liberal conservative uh, pressure group uh, that's what it says here um, and we are tweet on hashtag bright blue and hashtag cpc20 uh, so and you can follow the twitter our bright blue uh, and the gulbenkian foundation which is cgf underscore uk uh, now anyone who is watching this should be able to ask questions through something called Slido, I think these internet startups are running out of names. Um, but let us uh, get on with the business in hand, which is, uh, is uh, net zero carbon by 2050 a realistic uh, possibility? Uh, will public opinion in this country uh, bear it? Uh, most people are broadly in favor of um, uh, net zero, but uh, do they actually understand the consequences in practice? Um, and that is what we're here to discuss. Now, we've got Alexander Stafford, MP for Rother Valley, uh, one of the bricks in the red wall, uh, who is going to kick us off. Um, so, Alexander, it's all yours. I'm going to give you five minutes, then I'm told to shut you up. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much indeed for being here. It's great, great to be here. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm the new, M well, relatively new MP for Rother Valley, which is South Yorkshire, for those that don't know. Uh, new, first time Conservative in the seat ever. But prior to uh, being elected last December, I actually spent most of my career, most recent career, working in the energy and the environment sectors. So uh, I led up UK media for the WWF, the UK. Say the World Wildlife Fund, uh, and then late latterly uh, for Shell. So some would say quite a big jump from uh, the NGO sector to an oil giant, but I would say actually it's a, a natural fit and a very perfect uh, thing, and that's something I want to get onto later on. Uh, after becoming an MP, I was elected to serve on the Business Energy Industrial Strategy Select Committee, and we're working on proposals uh, and inquiries looking at the UK's net zero targets and the UK climate uh, summits. So in answer to the question, is it achievable? Yes. We, as a, as a Conservative government, have made great strides. This is probably the greenest Conservative government that we have ever had. We have uh, in immense support from the Prime Minister, but also from uh, colleagues. I think the new intake, the 109 new Conservative MPs are very green. The Conservative Environment Network is a very uh, prominent pressure group uh, in inside the Conservative Party as MPs, and we are working to try and make this happen. 2050 may sound a long way away, it's about 30 years, but actually to get to net zero by then, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. But I do very much think that we can rise to that challenge and we can get there. And there's several ways that we can do that. And I'm sure the other speakers will talk about the various challenges. But one thing that I'm very keen to talk about and express is this isn't a zero sum game. Getting to net zero shouldn't be a thing we almost dreading and sacrifice we have to make. What we have to do and sell this to the public is actually getting to net zero is not only good for our, the, our carbon emissions and good for the climate, but fundamentally it is immeasurably important for our economy. Now, if you go back about two, three hundred years, it was a carbon industry, i.e. coal industry, that actually made Britain boom and become, frankly, the greatest and richest country on Earth. Now, I very much believe by, by heading towards a net zero by 2050, with technology involved, we can actually recapture that position. And if we are one of the first movers uh, getting down to net zero, then we can actually have a new, almost uh, a revolution when it comes to our economy.
And let, let's be frank, the whole world is going to net zero. Some places sooner than others. Some will get there. Even the Russias, the Indias, the Chinas, the dirtiest countries. They are all, they've all got targets. China's got a 2060 a target to get there. Now, if we steal a march uh, on other countries, and by that I mean not only just get to net zero, but also put together the technology, the financial models, the structures to actually get there and actually help us get there, then we can actually sell, I mean, ex export that knowledge, expertise, that technology to other countries to help them get there. So if we get there first, put the technologies together first that gets there, then we can actually use this as a huge economic boon for our country by selling this technology abroad. And I know lots of technologies have already been sort of going forward, battery electric vehicles, uh, CCS in some countries, but there's still quite a few areas where the technology and the investment hasn't really come to the forefront. Now, one sector I'm very excited by is the hydrogen sector. Now, we can easily electrify passenger vehicles and small uh, lorries, but large HGVs, buses, they don't talk about trains, planes, boats. We cannot run them on battery and we will not be able to run them on traditional batteries in the next 30, 40 years. We need a new technology. And the only way to get to net zero is for all our transport system to be decarbonized. Now, I very much believe that hydrogen, you know, and when you do green hydrogen, is the perfect way of doing that. All it emits is water vapor. We could run on the powertrains, the heavier vehicles, the planes, the buses, and actually have the same stand of life. Now, if we get that, invest heavily in a hydrogen strategy, we can then use that technology and sell that technology abroad. So we can start manufacturing hydrogen, manufacturing these hydrogen planes, trains in the UK and export them. So by going to net zero, we can actually have a huge economic boost for our country. And to me, that's important because when we are selling to the public that we should go to low carbon, we should sell, we're going to go to low carbon not because we want to improve the environment, or not just because we want to improve the environment, but because we as the UK can use this to boost and bolster our economy, increase jobs, increase our exports, and really sell it as an absolute positive. Because one thing that often happens in this debate, and working in the, you know, the, the NGO sector, I know this firsthand, is too many people talking down about the negatives about uh, low carbon and the imposition and how we have to make sacrifices to get there. And I say, no, we're not making sacrifices. Going low carbon and net zero is actually going to could be one of the best things that happens to our country for 150 years, because we can actually really? have a positive impact. And I'm just being cut off, I'm sure. So I, you've got the gist. No. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much, Alexander. Brilliant uh, impersonation of uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, Enthusiasm for hydrogen. Uh, that was uh, that was ec an excellent introduction, and I hope uh, I hope we could uh, pick you up on some of those points in a moment. But let's hear now from Richard Walker, uh, managing director of Iceland, which has cut its carbon footprint by something substantial. Uh, Richard, tell us about it. Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay because um, it's very glitchy from my side. Um, but I'll keep talking until I'm told otherwise. Uh, yeah, so we, um, we, can. we, like many other businesses, have, uh, have done, uh, starting to do a great deal of work on, on carbon. Um, and we have a, a similar target to a lot in our sector, which is to become net zero by 2042. We already have 100% renewable electricity. Um, we have invested in more efficient air conditioning, refrigeration, LED lighting, uh, vehicle efficiency, et cetera. Um, and we're also importantly looking now at a full life cycle analysis for our packaging, our own label packaging, uh, because that's often where the plastic debate uh, can get sidetracked. Um, so in totality, our scope one and two uh, carbon emissions are currently 46,000 tonnes. That's down from quarter of a million tonnes in 2011. And we've done that. Um, via saving money. So now my finance director is a, a huge fan of net zero. Seems to make sense for him as well. Um, it, it's good for profitability in that we can reduce food waste, we can save money on LED lighting or reducing cost. However, I'm still not happy with the state of play. I think we need to make much more effort in reducing carbon in totality. Uh, and I mean that as a business, but also as a nation. Um, our scope three emissions, we're nowhere with reducing, and it's exceptionally difficult for us uh, to go all the way up our supply chains and, and deal with those. I think the best way is through trade agreements and diplomatic solutions. Secondly, whilst as a nation our production has gone down, our consumption of carbon has gone up, and that's because we've offshored most of our emissions to China. So we need to stop kidding ourselves. 
The final thing I wanted to mention was the concept of what net zero actually is. Um, it's often based on CCS technology that barely exists today. Um, yet it's a big part of everyone's calculus, governments and businesses in their net zero ambitions. So I think that whilst we need much faster emission reductions, and we can see that through the global shutdown of COVID, um, we've actually barely had enough emission reductions. If you look at the 7% that we need every year from now until 2030, to get to at least halfway to net zero. But we actually also need to find money as a government uh, to invest in CCC technology and also hydrogen and things like that. Um, especially considering we've maxed out our nation's credit card on dealing with corona pandemic. So for me, and I say this as a free marketeer, I think probably the best way of doing so is to introduce a carbon tax. Um, but it needs to be one that is socially just. And the reason I think a carbon tax would work is because it would uh, not only change behavior, but it would raise money as well. Um, Finally, you know, our customers, um, some of them only have uh, £25 a week perhaps to spend on food. So uh, re reducing carbon emissions is certainly not on their list of priorities. However, I would say that they're certainly fans of doing so, so long as it can be done in a solely just uh, zero cost way to them as consumers. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Richard. Would you uh, would you say that you've uh, done the easy bit so far? Absolutely. Yeah, we've we've done we've done the easy bit, which is about saving money, um, and therefore it's an easy win internally, but also externally to our customers. Um, and why you know I think some sort of level playing field via carbon taxation, but also uh, whatever diplomatic trade arrangements we have is probably the only way we're then going to progress to the hard yards in terms of going that extra mile to scope three. Brilliant. Okay, well, look, we'll, we'll cut to that. Um, I'm sure there'll be, there'll be questions. Uh, now, Rachel Wolf, um, the, you look as if you've frozen on my screen, but uh, I'm hoping oh, yeah. you're, oh, you're still alive. Good, excellent. That's brilliant. Okay. Um, do you, you, you're a manifesto, famously, so tell us, uh, tell us how you think this is going to work out over the next five years. Um, so the first thing I should say is that I feel very bad after um, the first incredibly uplifting speech for injecting a little bit more um, concern about how we kind of get to net zero from here. And, and the reason for that concern is that while I think um, that vision outlined of getting to a new future with new technologies which gain all sorts of advantages for the UK in terms of competition may well be true, I think we also have to recognise two things are going to have to happen on the route to that. Um, the first is very, very substantial transition costs. The, the reason people use fossil fuels is not because they're ideologically attached to them, but because they're cheaper. Um, and in switching to other alternatives across every sector right now, um, then that creates some transition costs, which is why things like carbon pricing are so important because they start to level the cost between different options. The second is because it requires people to change what they do. Um, and right now, people are quite uncertain about whether they want to use um, a heat pump intend instead of a gas boiler or change their car. Um, and so you have to persuade people to change very substantially across all of the things they do, what their life looks like. Um, I think that's achievable, but I think in order to um, get there, we need to understand really where the public are right now. Bright Blue's just published, I think, a very interesting report on this. But let me talk about the focus groups and polling that I've done recently on this issue and what I think it means. The first is that people unquestionably care about the environment and they care about it deeply um, and they are willing in principle to make a large number of changes um, to safeguard their children and their grandchildren's future. But um, I think we have to recognize that, first of all, 
it, while in polling, they'll kind of surface show that they support net zero. A lot of people have never heard the term. And if they do hear the term, they don't know what it means. There's a lot of confusion between yeah. what is air quality, what is plastics, what is emissions. This is starting from a very, very low information base. I think the second thing to understand is that there are some quite core cool conditions required to maintain public consent. Um, the first is people are understandably very impatient of regulation or charges when there aren't credible, easy uh, alternatives for them to switch to. So household heating would be a really obvious example where until we know whether uh, we want people to go to hydrogen in their pipes or heat pumps or something else, people are quite impatient of their gas bills going up until those kind of credible alternatives exist. The second, which I think, again, will probably not surprise everyone, is they want it to be fair. And fair means two things. The first is that everyone is bearing a burden. I think I'll come back to this in a bit, but one of the reasons I think carbon pricing is one of the more um, credible policies in terms of maintaining public consent is that it shows that everyone is kind of paying their part. And the third, which was just mentioned, is that no one is bearing unbearable costs which probably brings us to COVID because we are making decisions about what we do in net zero in the midst of um, recovering or starting to recover from the pandemic, which is that with every month that passes, every week that passes, concerns about the economy are rising and people's concerns about their own costs are rising as well. While simultaneously, I think, people understand that if taxes have to go up in part to sort of pay for the recovery, then taxes that also move us to a better environmental end or a sort of better end state are, are as good a way to go as any. So all of that, I suppose, ends us with saying there is a path through here. It is complicated. It requires us to be very, very clear with people about what actually net zero is, which I don't think we've quite really started to do yet. Um, what alternatives it is that we want them to switch to um, while maintaining as much kind of choice and freedom in that as possible. And third, limiting it so that costs aren't unbearable. I think if you do all those things, you can get there. But but I don't think we should be halcyon about it. It is a complex path and people are starting from a very low base of understanding. Brilliant. Uh, an extremely clear uh, analysis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, let's uh, go to Richard Black next, who is from the uh, Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit. Uh, he's been on the television with Sir Richard. To I always get them mixed up. How do you answer some of Rachel's points? Sorry, Richard, I can't hear you. I think you are you muted. I still can't hear you. No. Still yeah. And you've this this support uh, on public attitudes to uh, to zero. Uh, tell us. What it says. Um, yes. Hello. Um, um, as I mentioned, we recently published a report called "Going Greener" just yesterday about a lot of the I'm not stuff. Not getting any, on any sound from Anvar either. Um, sorry about this. Uh, <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me now? Hello? I can hear you, Anvar. You can. All right. Um, so just to restart. So we yesterday have published a report going greener 
very much talking about public contributions at zero about the credibility of achieving it and how the public thinks about responsibility and about the very policy dimensions. And I think I'm going to echo quite a bit of what Rachel said, actually. Um, I, I think she had very much similar points around kind of consent. I think the kind of key theme I kind of want to pick up on is that the environment is it's not a partisan issue. And I think that's kind of like the beauty of it. I think it's a very divided political landscape that we're in. There's a lot that people across age, education, party, party vote, Brexit lines agree on, on environment. So there's there's a lot of potential there to achieve, to achieve action. You know, talk quite a bit about that. Um, I think what's important to recognize is that public is quite skeptical about achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 around almost 60. I think it's unlikely. And at the same time, the public does think that we are all responsible for it. The government, the businesses, the businesses big and small, the public and individuals themselves are all seen as very responsible for contributing to action. So there's definitely, a lot, as Rachel has pointed out, a lot of will for achieving for, for achieving this. Um, and to pick up on this kind of like partisan existence of non partisan device, you have issues, for example, eating, eating a lot of meat is seen as kind of like a small individual action that individuals can do to, to help. And even though it's sometimes fine as a culture war, actually, we, we find that almost half of, of Cory Motors either support, either support the idea or have already started doing, um, have already started adding their meat intake to contribute to that action. So, even on that quite controversial issue, there's quite a bit of support from our society where you wouldn't expect it to. And it's the same on something like carbon tax, for example. Carbon tax is, is supported by about 45% of, of Tory voters. A very substantial amount, considering we're, we're talking about a tax increase, um, a pretty general tax increase. Now, of course, carbon tax is quite interesting, and, it, and popularity will depend quite a lot on how it's allocated and who which degree people are paying for it, but there's definitely a lot of a lot of will for that kind of broad and quite ambitious action from parts of society where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. But there are concerns, and the concerns around price and how it would affect them, how, how it affect individuals. And the public is again quite willing for the government to step in and to provide support. So for example, there's very high support for providing subsidies uh, for low-income families or for small businesses. It takes the kind of action that's needed to reach net zero, such as heating systems, for installing insulation, that kind of stuff. So even though there's concerns on price, there's definitely a lot of support for government coming in and helping out with those, with those issues. We're going to expand on this kind of a lot of issues around energy and residential heating. I think what I want to recognize is that there's definitely a lack of information on specific heat and heating systems is one prime example of this. People don't know what heat pumps are for the most part. They don't haven't heard of hydrogen boilers. So there's a challenge in overcoming like the lack of information on, on action that is very necessary to get to net zero. And the government needs to be doing more about making sure that information reaches people, particularly specific demographics from of a lot of educational background, for example, who are like often quite less informed or opinionated on this issue. Because if government doesn't provide help to take those actions, doesn't help to provide information to get people to understand them, it's very likely that we'll have an increase in opposition to this kind of stuff, adding of costs lost on individuals, especially the ones with low income. So there's lots of good and positive stuff in public opinion. There's lots of will to help achieve net zero take action but government must meet challenges to on costs and on helping people achieve pay for those transition and to make sure that the necessary steps that need to be taken are communicated to the public brilliant uh, thank you very much Eva. now let me see if i can go back, back to uh, richard black from the eciu richard um can i hear you okay hi john yes, are you I hearing can. me now 
Fantastic. That's all it was. Wonderful. A, a, right. a triumph for Brilliant. one browser over another. Apologies for that. Uh, thanks for thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so we're, we're a small but very pompously titled think tank. I've done quite a lot of work on net zero over the years. And before that, my background's as a journalist with the BBC covering science and environment. So I think there are three basic points I, I'd, I'd want to chuck in here, uh, John, if I may. Um, the first is that um, this is actually something that we need to do getting to net zero by 2050. We need to do it because it's in law. We need to do it because when you look at the science of climate change, global net zero by 2050 is kind of non-negotiable. It is the way to stop climate change. Saying that we can't do it is tantamount to saying we can't stop climate change, so we absolutely need to do it. Uh, from the government's point of view, they absolutely need to get on track pretty soon because if they don't, they frankly, the government will have zero credibility as a host at next year's massive diplomatic set piece, which is COP26 in Glasgow, the UN Climate Conference. So the only question really is how. That's it. That's the only question we should be talking about. Second point, people are basically on side with the principle of doing this. Concern about climate change is high. It's always been climate change. It's always been high. Where people are familiar with the solutions, like renewable energy, they're very much in favour. They're massively in favour, for example, of home insulation and the use of public money to support it. When they're not, when they're not familiar with something, then obviously we see low or sometimes sort of you know very low levels of support. So heat pumps, for example, if you don't know what they are, it sounds a bit weird and so on. So there's a massive public information job here. Um, and um, I think that the, the, one of the main jobs that government needs to do, and sorry, government does need to take the lead on this, is actually showing people that the changes to their lifestyle, and here I, I part company slightly with Rachel Wolf, um, are actually not that massive. If you're going to drive an electric car rather than a fossil fuel, fuel it, you're still got a car in your garage. It's still going to take you where you want to go. It's really not that big a deal. And so the question is not um, is not about heat pumps. Is that are you willing to have a house that's heated by a heat pump? If people don't know what it is, actually the question is, if you can have something which is a zero carbon heating system and in combination with insulation is going to give you something that is just keeps your house just as warm as it was, uh, and by the way, is going to give you a much lower energy bill, then people are probably are going to go for it. You need that information piece before you can really ask the question. So I part company with those on the right, you know, on, in the Conservative Party, on the fringes, you know, the, the Charles Moores and the Nigel Lawsons of this world who would say it's really difficult. They're wrong. So are the people in Extinction Rebellion who say exactly the same. It's really not that massive a deal. And the third thing I think is for government, and, and actually all the opinions show the public expects government to take the lead on this. So sorry, that's your job, guys. Um, be dull if necessary. Um, uh, be credible. Um, we can no real. There, there is no magical solution. I mean, Alexander, I agree with ninety percent of your your piece on hydrogen that you had in the paper. But when you say it is the solution, it isn't. It's part of the solution, and it's definitely not as big a part of the solution as energy efficiency and electrification. There may be a bit more boring, but you know that's fine. And be credible. Coronavirus has shown that people are actually very willing to be led by government when they when they're shown it's the right thing to do and when there's credibility. But when we have a prime minister, you know, who says on the one hand we've got twenty six percent of our country protected for nature, and then the moment you look at that, it really isn't protected for nature. It's largely protected for landscape values and recreation and things. That's not credibility. Uh, if you have a prime minister who goes on the international stage speaking to world leaders. And the main point is Britain will never be lagging on lagging. That's not credible. So be credible. Be boring when you need to. Be consistent and lead. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good uh, series of challenges uh, there. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, let's just take some questions from the audience. I've got one from Grace Froggart, which is... Uh, whether it's possible to maintain or improve uh, with the future. Uh, that is the interesting question, is it not? Whether we can have as high a standard of living as it is perceived by people with zero carbon. Uh, and I will go to Alexander first on this one. Um, uh, is that uh, possible? And can you I, sell I, it? 
No, I don't think it is going to possibly have the same standard of living. I think it's possible to have a better standard of living. Because let's be honest, a warmer home is going to be better for you. A quieter car is going to be better for you. A less polluting car is going to be better for you. More nature is going to be better for you. So, and I think this is this is the nub of the conversation, how it's moved on the last sort of 10, 15 years. Last 10 years ago, it's all about imposition. We have to go live in a cave and that's how we get into zero carbon. Now, I think very believe this, this technology is better than current technology. If you drive a Tesla, ignore the price, it fundamentally is a far better car than a, than a fossil fuel car. It's far better by everyone. So I'd say this technology, while still expensive, but the price will come down, will give you a better standard of living. And that's what we need to tell people, that even if you don't care about the environment, and let's be honest, not many people, not many people know about whole net zero and carbon. People interested. But if you say, I've got a better car, I'll give you a better home, a cleaner environment, cleaner air for the ch your children, people are going to say, yes, thank you very much. And that's what we need to keep telling people. It's a better standard of living, far better than we have today. Because if we have this conversation, oh, it's going to be worse. No one's going to buy into this. It's going to be better for you. So yes, very much so. <laughs> Rachel, uh, do you buy that? I suppose I put it a slightly different way. Um, if it isn't possible, we're not going to get to net zero because people won't allow it. So um, I do, but I people can. Oh, did you hear me? No, um, <laughs> that was going to go to Richard, but he's, he's disappeared, Richard Walker. Um, Richard Walker, ah, can you hear me? Um, the audio is terrible from my side for some reason. Can you just repeat the question? Uh, well, uh, the, I mean, there's been a number of questions. I'd just be interested in your response to all of them, really. I mean, the essential question is... Uh, will will people's standard of living be higher in 2050 if we have net zero, or will it be perceived as higher? You'll you'll have. Can you put it in the chat? <laughs> okay, I'll put it. I'll put it in the chat. Rachel, can can anybody hear Rachel? I saw some people giving her a thumbs up. So Rachel, you just talk and ignore me. Um, all right, so why don't I come back on uh, Richard's provocations while we're waiting for other Richard to read the question. Um, so I think, why don't we focus on every, where everybody agrees, because this is in some sense a remarkably, possibly too consensual panel, which is, we, we all think this is the right aim fundamentally. Um, two, we think that the only way to reach that aim is by having technologies and ways of uh, changing people's lives that makes those lives pleasant and as good, if not better than today, or in a democracy, people won't in the end stand for it. So I think there's sort of broad agreement on that. I think to the extent that there is disagreement, it's whether those changes are um, substantial or not right now. And I think in some areas they're not, and in some areas there are. So if we take the bright blue paper, um, unsurprisingly, one of the areas people are least excited about is eating much less meat, because one of the big contributors to our emissions is cat. Um, now, I'm not saying that's uh, insoluble. It may be insoluble because we reduce emissions elsewhere and we just accept the ones from cat. It might be that over time people get persuaded because you know, to Richard Black's point, once they've experienced vegetarianism, they'll love it. But this is not a minor challenge. And I think just as it is wrong to be kind of doom and gloom about it, it is all, nothing, nothing is more um, destructive in public debates than pretending something is super simple and easy, only for people to later discover it's not. We've made that mistake in lots of different areas, and I really don't think we should make it this time. Um, I'll let Richard Walker come back now. Hopefully he um, has read the question. Uh, I'm sorry about this because I can't hear Rachel. So this is the most peculiar uh, discussion ever. The chair is uh, unable to hear anybody. Uh, so I'm going to just let you lot uh, talk amongst yourself. You could see the questions which are on the on the chat. Uh, and I just <laughs> yeah. answer them I can, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. imagine that we're listening to it. OK, great. Well, hopefully you can hear me because I can't really hear any of you. But um, yeah, can, can we? I think the, the question is basically around uh, 
can we do all this without reducing people's standard of living? And what will the standard of living be like for society in 2050? Um, uh, if you look at, you know, all, all the polling, um, generally when asked the specific question, Ipsos polling, etc., people will say, of course, they want climate uh, action on climate change to be prioritised. And uh, they see it as important as uh, the corona pandemic. The only problem, of course, is that they expect someone else to deal with it. And um, I can tell you the cold business reality is that uh, consumers certainly won't pay any more uh, for ethical products, lower carbon products, etc. cetera. Um, of course, some consumers will. In my sector, if, um, you know, if you shop, but Waitrose and you can afford the middle class luxury of uh, virtue signaling and being able to afford to pay more for ethical products, then, uh, of course, it is an option. Uh, but for the vast majority of society, of course, it, it's simply uh, not possible. So I think we have to um, be, be very open and clear about that. And that's not pessimistic. That's just being realistic. Um, I also don't think we'll win the debate by telling people what not to do. You can't eat meat. Um, you can't go on holiday, etc. So I suppose in the future, what will the standard of living be like? Well, hopefully it will, it will simply be more equal. And if you look at the um, uh, vastly growing levels of inequality in every developed nation all around the world, not just the UK, but particularly in America, but also here in the UK, inequality is on the rise. Um, so, of course, I think the answer to who pays for it and what will the standard of being uh, result in, um, it, it will have to come from uh, richer people, from higher consumers, from people like me, effectively. Um, so we need to kind of iron out uh, some of this inequality to enable the transition that we need to a lower carbon future. Hopefully, you heard uh, of that. I did. Uh, that was brilliant. And uh, that was a very good answer. Um, but I need to take some more questions from, from the audience. Emma Wade, uh, let me put this question to you, Anvar. Emma Wade says, is it possible to clean up aviation while continuing to encourage buy? Uh, what, what if people continue to want to travel overseas? I mean, I, mean, I, don't, I think we're going kind to of like Rachel's point is that I bet is that people are, a lot of people will not be happy with kind of like lowering the, the standard of living and like giving up on holidays and things like that themselves. But the, and any kind of government action to attempt to increase prices to kind of like force people to buy less is really unpopular. Um, so it, it is very much about kind of like getting the technological change to, to, to get us there potentially. There's obviously a sort of, there's always, of course, the technology, some kind of technology developing the development that exists. So, for example, kind of like Hydrogen fuel planes so are being like discussed about a very early kind of stage idea, I, I think. Um, so I think I think it is very much about getting the technology to get there because consumers themselves won't make the change. Uh, they primarily won't make the change. Uh, okay, brilliant. I've got another question from a Richard Watts, which I shall put to Richard Black. Uh, it's all the Richards today. Uh, Richard Watts says, is it really possible to change systems in 35 million homes uh, between now and 2035? I'm not quite sure what the 2035 date is, but I'm sure you will, Richard. <laughs> um, well, it, they don't all have to be changed by 2035, but um, it, by, by 2050 is, is probably more realistic. Is it feasible? Yes, it is. I mean, on average, a, Br a British person changes their gas boiler every 15 years. That's the average lifetime of a gas boiler. And 80% of our houses roughly are heated by gas boilers. Now, changing a heating system for a heat pump is a bit more complex than changing your boiler. Changing to a hydrogen boiler probably isn't much more complex. So in principle, you're simply talking about doing replacement at the same kind of rate, but just replacing it with a different thing. But the key thing, of course, is to get started on that early, because if this is what you're going to do you can't then wait till 2049 and say we've got to replace them you have to get up get on with it now and do what you can now do the no-brainers now if you, if you don't mind i'd just like to come back on a couple of other points if i if i may john um just is it possible yes we need to look at the evidence of history here and you know since the rio earth summit in 92 
the UK economy has expanded by something like 70% and we've almost halved our emissions. There were people in 1992 who said it couldn't be done. They said the lights would go out, it would ruin the economy. Didn't happen. There were people when the Climate Change Act came into force in 2008 who said it won't work, uh, industry will flee the country, the lights will go out. It didn't happen. We have to learn from history here. The meat thing, Committee on Climate Change talks about not ending meat. I mean, that's ridiculous, mass, ve mass veganism, but about a 20% reduction in eating of red meats and so on from here in 2050. That's basically in line with what, what people are doing anyway. That's the way diets are changing anyway. And one angle that hasn't been explored half enough in this, in this issue, for my mind, is switching meats, because actually it's beef and lamb that are the really high-end meats. If, you if everyone, for example, re you know, replaced a lot of their beef and lamb, with pork and, and, and chicken and so on, that would actually get you quite a long, a, a, a long way there. Just the third other point is that this is not a uniquely British thing. It's an international issue, the move to net zero. And the EU and China have just both brokered quite a very important diplomatic deal that will probably see both of them, giant blocks, moving towards net zero around mid-century. Britain is not going to win by being out of step with that. Uh, brilliant. Can, uh, I just, can I just add something on the on the meat comment, John? Um, oh, our course. fastest growing category is our no meat um, range of of, uh, of meals, and and as I keep referring to, you know, this this is for um, uh, our customer, you know, who tends to be the lower demographics across across the nation. So this this isn't a kind of middle class thing you know this, this is something that everyone is engaged with and uh wanting to try out and it's quite heartening actually to to see uh the very rapid growth in in that category i can just jump, jump again oh, by sorry. health concerns or price sorry um i think uh, i think uh, i think it's trend yeah, I think it's trend as well. You know, um, everyone's aspirational, even if they can't afford to pay a lot more for it. But, um, you know, so long as it's good quality product at the best quality price, people are now mindful of the environmental costs, but, but also health as well, for sure. So it's a whole mix of things there. Alex wanted to come in. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on the sort of uh, the food thing. I, I, I love my meat. I love, I'm very much so. I don't think we should stop eating meat. But I, I agree, the amount of people are eating meat is being massively reduced. But I think that's mainly driven by health concerns. And I think people are accepting that the more sort of red meat you eat, it's fine to eat some, but it is bad for you, increases the chance of getting certain types of cancer, colon cancer. So actually, it's better for you to go a more healthier lifestyle, more carbon neutral uh, uh, lifestyle. And that's what, go back to my earlier point, by saying actually, we can have a better standard of living by low carbon. And there's so many other positive effects of going low carbon that all that, 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 that I think we get wrapped up too much talking about carbon and not looking at the wider impact which happen to be low carbon and selling those benefits. And that's how we can get there. I think that is how we get the, the public on board. Can I just pick up on a couple of the other points which have been floating around about the... the the, the homes uh can we change our homes to, to change the home heating system well 90 something percent of homes in the country have central heating even those who were built you know hundreds of years ago we have changed our heating system before we can do again what is important though is you build the right houses so we build new houses and the government's going to target for a million homes in the next four years and it's we need huge amounts of homes make sure those homes are built with the heat pumps make sure those homes are built if they have a driveway with electric chargers on the driveway for cars, make sure they are built with batteries inside the homes. And that's going to be the next future. That's going to be the future. Every home in 10 years will have a battery inside it. So you can take, uh, well, take have solar panels on the roof, take the energy from the sun and store it. That is going to be so important. So we need to make sure we build these million plus houses in the next four years. They are homes of the future, not ones which need to be then retro step fitted. And just one last point mentioning about the aviation. That is why we need things like hydrogen, sustainable aviation fuels to get to that. Because I actually believe that people should be traveling and flying. I'm a great point in that travel broadens the mind and everyone should be doing that to see other cultures and lifestyles. So we need to do that in a, in a way and that goes back to the technology. And if we, the UK, can build that technology and sell the technology, we can actually have a huge dividends for the rest of the world. And just one final point. We keep talking about net zero. What we're not talking about is no carbon. We're always going to need some sort of carbon in our environment, whether it's from animals, whether it's from transport. We need to also talk about how we get rid of that residual carbon, whether it's by CCS, 
whether it's by a, a plant, a natural capital, and the like, we need to we need to have that sensible conversation about how many you know, swamps are we going to reintroduce, how many bogs are we going to reintroduce, how many trees are we going to plant to take that carbon away, because we can never, we'll never get to, to zero carbon. It's net zero, and that's incredibly important to remember. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I've got a, as well as responding to all of those, Rachel, uh, I wanted to uh, put a question to you from a Miss Dean which is about the ideology of capitalism. I mean, perhaps it's because I work for the independent, all our readers are violently anti-capitalist, but there does seem to be an assumption that capitalism is uh, the cause of the problems of uh, climate emergency uh, rather than the solution. Oh, sorry, Rachel. <laughs> uh, I thought it was just me that can't hear you, but I don't think anybody can hear you. I'm really sorry about this. No, no, nobody, oh, can, nobody can, can hear me. Can you hear me now? I'm really now? sorry about that. Uh, I'm so sorry. All right, I'll try and get a more kissy um, I think the changes in living standards over the last couple of centuries oh, we can, have been yeah. right, carry on. and wonderful, right? Like my life would have been, by comparison, miserable. 200 years ago, and we should be extremely thankful that we escaped the Malthusian trap and we've been able to grow the population and live um, successful lives free of hunger and uh, terror for our children's um, future. So, so no, I do not think that we should feel that this has been a terrible outcome. Um, the, um, so, and nor do I think that demolishing the capitalist system um, if that means the ability for people to go on holidays and buy things and sell things and create new businesses um, should be removed. So, so I, would, I, I don't think it would astonish anyone that I would reject that. Um, given though that I think we're probably moving to kind of semi-closing remarks, I think um, the, the thing I worry about a little bit from this conversation, agreeing with much and thinking of huge uh, uh, um, hugely important things that others have said is um, the vision they have sketched out is so easy and so much better than everything we have today. We don't need to talk about public opinion, right? We don't need to talk about public opinion if everything is going to be much, much nicer tomorrow than it is today. We just have no problem, right? And if no one has to pay for anything, if no taxes have to go up, no one has a problem with public opinion. I think I am... Uh, absolutely persuadable that in 40 years we will be in a situation that is wealthier and has new technology and is more innovative than the world we are in today and that um, moving to net zero will be one part of that but the journey is not wholly smooth and it is quite expensive and it does require people to shift things that they uh, do somewhat faster than they might otherwise like absolutely we should sketch for them the end goal and why that's important but um this is this is more of a public challenge than i think or in my view than i think some others on this panel would um <laughs> as chair I, could, I couldn't hear any of that i'm sure it was absolutely marvelous i'm hoping to catch up later but anvo it looks as if you want to speak fire away um, yes, this kind of picks up on the, on the capitalism point, is that the potential of environment to become a, a very controversial and bloody political arena is actually probably quite high. I mean, you see, you see with things like Extinction Rebellion, potentially kind of like flashpoint of, of a culture war around that, and I think that's kind of like a very significant threat in you know, that regard, because if, if things become like eating less meat becomes like very good. Or kind of like aggressive action on environmental change becomes a very massive part of the green agenda, particularly on the left. Then it could potentially polarize polarize the electorate. And it, because I think the UK and like some other Western countries, the, the, the conservatives have gotten, gotten a 
realistic assessment of the environment and what needs to be done. But, but so the, I think the slice of risk will backslide on the side of the conservative to do like strategy, which we have in the US. So I think the risk, but the risk of a culture more emerging is kind of one side polarizes and then another side polarizes and responds quite high. So it, it, it's important for, for policymakers and for both sides, I think, that carefully to avoid those kind of traps from happening as, as a kind of changes and sometimes changes need to be implemented. Uh, thank you. Yeah, very interesting point. I mean, Richard Black, do you want to comment on that? You you made some passing remark about how Extinction Rebellion were like the right wing climate change deniers. Yeah, I think that sort of negativity that it's all hair shirts and, and, and basically they make it sound so infeasible. It's just it, it's I think it's really Disempo it's really disempowering, actually, and I think this is a this is a non-quantified statement. But I think that this is achieved much easier if people feel that they have agency and they have choices and they, and they want to do it. Um, I just a couple, couple of other things I, I wanted to come back on. I mean, I appreciate Rachel your sort of concern about the cost of everything, but I just think it's absolutely fundamentally untrue that people were uh, always reluctant to spend their money on anything. They're always reluctant, they always buy the kind of cheapest of everything. They don't. We all make choices in our own lives to buy things that are not necessarily the cheapest. People will absolutely wear a bit more taxation or a bit of a higher bill, provided they know what it's for and it's for something that they believe in. And I just want to come back to the other point, one of the points I made at the beginning, that if you conclude that net zero is not possible, then you are concluding that we are not going to stop climate change. You are basically willing to usher in a world where basically temperatures keep rising, extreme weather impacts keep rising, um, societies are displaced, are displaced, et cetera, et cetera. You know the picture. So the question really, to my mind, isn't whether it's feasible. It's basically what actually has to be done to make it feasible. Very fair point. Um, Alexander, do you want to come back on any of that? Yeah, I just sort of, I completely agree. Hallelujah, Richard, about uh, Extinction Rebellion. I think they are the worst. I say they're worse than the right wing of the uh, of the Conservative Party, the climate change or, or any climate change deniers, because at least climate change deniers we can just say are being silly. Whereas Extinction Rebellion, <laughs> I understand the point they're trying to make, but they are frankly damaging the argument. So I completely agree. They are the worst worst offenders. Uh, back to sort of Rachel's point. Uh, I don't think there's going to be that huge cost in the sense that there's going to be a cost. But I still go back to thinking the, the majority of the public like saying, oh, yes, you want low carbon. But they don't really understand it. But they can understand their lives getting better. And technology. if you go back 10 years, 15 years, 20 years with the Internet technology, things have moved on so rapidly and they all keep going moving on forward. So I can't see there being this huge uh, cost to anything because, as Richard said, there's going to be a cost of not doing anything. And you have to go factor that in because, you know, with temperatures rising and some sea levels rising, there's going to be high pressure on crops and water through things. So natural prices are going to rise anyway. So that sort of so some of those price rises, which will happen, of course, were going to be negated by the, the, the price rises of doing nothing anyway. But then if you're selling this idea and we are selling idea of a better future and, and, and everyone will get back behind that, even the climate change deniers want better technology and cleaner technology regardless of whether they believe in the the sort of the ideology behind it we want to take the sort of science we want to take some of the sort of mysticism out of it just say things are going to get better if you invest in this if you buy new pro products new technology and that can move things forward and i also agree with Richard. people are willing to pay uh, more money in certain ways you know look at mobile phones mobile phones now are far more expensive than they were a few years ago people change them every two years but they are so much better than a couple of years ago. But people are willing to pay more money for better technology, better product. And that is what we have to keep coming back to, is engaging the public because of, of what they actually care about. And what they care about is their better life rather than, frankly, banging on about anything green, environmental, carbon. If we can lose those three words from our addiction, green, environment and carbon, we will get there a lot quicker, I believe, because we can talk about it, but we don't necessarily need the public to talk about it. We ought to bamboozle them. We just want to say things are going to get better. <laughs> Things can only get better, Alexander. Great slogan. You should you should adopt that in politics. 
Uh, let's go over to Richard Walker just for a final word about customers paying uh, more for things. Uh, well, they won't. Um, that's a fact. But uh, I, I've had a few sound issues through this. But one, one of the questions I heard was around capitalism and is that to blame? And I think this is all obviously related. But um, I, I don't think we need to change capitalism, but we do need to change how we do capitalism. And um, it, it's clear that one very damaging assumption is uh, the, the continual quest for perpetual growth on a, on a finite planet. Um, Kate Raworth has, has written an excellent book called Donut Economics, which you, you may have read. Um, but uh, it, in it, you know, she talks about how we need to be a bit more agnostic about growth and, and really pursue economies that, that make us thrive, whether or not they grow. Um, now, whilst that may all sound a bit pie in the sky, I, I do actually think it's um, it's starting to happen. And there are countries now around the world, such as uh, New Zealand, that are putting well-being budgets ahead of uh, GDP growth as the primary metric of success. Because I think by uh, endlessly pursuing growth for the sake of growth, um, it, it can lead to very bad um, outcomes, particularly for developed economies uh, like the West. Uh, very good. I think we've got time for the final round of, of questions, although we've got a bit of a bit of extra time. Um, I'm afraid I don't fully understand this question, but there's a question from Martin Higgins. How are the National Grid's ageing power stations going to cope uh, as the country progresses to battery powered transportation? Does anybody want to take that question on? <laughs> Or, do, uh, Rachel, do you want to respond to uh, any of the things that we've heard so far? Well, I think Alex did want to come back on that question, so I should let him, probably. Just very briefly, uh, and I go back to, as uh, Richard mentioned, article written, I hate banging on about hydrogen. Electric, electric vehicles are one solution. But they're not the only solution. Hydrogen is another option for the for the heavy duty. So we, all, so we need to have a range of fuels for different sort of transport. We need to have that variety. But clearly, we do need to upgrade our, our networks. Clearly, if we want a more electrified future, we will need to, as a country, need to invest in that. But that's no different to any other critical infrastructure, sort of building you know, roads or airplanes or airport, airports or, or ports. We need to, critical infrastructure. So we need to upgrade uh, our networks, clearly. Okay, I've got one final question from someone called William. Is battery technology a limiting factor in reaching net zero? Richard Black. It doesn't have to be. Uh, and I think the answer to this is tied in with the previous question as well. And the key is really uh, the system. It's transforming, transforming the system in line with what net zero demands. Um, and I think, you know, offshore wind power has been an amazing success story in the UK. Basically, government put in support and at the right time established a market mechanism. You now have real competition. Prices went down through the floor. So it's basically setting the market up with the right kind of regulation that's going to provide what you need. So networks have to be strengthened. The incentives have to be there for people to provide batteries and also what's called demand response so are uh, people willing to turn things off when they don't need them uh, at times of, of high demand, more interconnectors between countries, so you share electricity. All this stuff's well understood. There's probably uh, something that needs to be done with Ofgem so that part of their sort of formal purpose is to deliver the grid of the future. But if that's done in a sensible way, then there's absolutely no reason why it can't be done. There's a very interesting study, oh, 15 years old now in Germany, showing that actually you could do the whole of German power system with 100% renewables, provided you have everything else in place. Fantastic. Okay, I'll uh, put a one, one last question for a one sentence answer from all of you, uh, which is from uh, Mike Goodman. How can we educate the population to understand uh, net zero? Uh, Anvar. Um. Advertise <laughs> and provide subsidies for a lot of the transitions you need, for a lot of the changes you need, basically. Okay, very good. Rachel? Um, we haven't actually talked about it that much for something this big. Um, we haven't told people what they we want them to switch to. So I think those would be um, pretty major first steps. 
Well, I hope everybody could hear that because because uh, I couldn't. Uh, Richard Walker. Can you can you repeat the question? Last word. Uh, about educating, how do you educate people to understand the concept of net zero? Well, um, you need to make it relevant to them. Um, this this isn't necessarily net zero, but with regards to something complicated. Oh. Yeah. I think John's frozen now. I'll answer the question. You don't you don't educate people. The public don't need to know the words net zero. You educate them about how the world's going to get better with better technologies and better future. So you don't talk about net zero. I'll pick up from there with a little <laughs> anecdote if I can. Good I was listening to football on so, five on Okay, yeah. well look. Sorry. Go yeah, just one, one, one little anecdote, if I can, John. I was listening to the football on Radio 5 Live a couple of years ago uh, when I was actually thinking about this very question about whether people could, you know, would understand easily what net zero. And there was one of the football pundits on there who was talking about the spend of a football club being net zero. And I thought, if that works on 5 Live football, we can probably do it. <laughs> very good. Look, well, thank you very much for all the panelists and for uh anybody watching i hope you've been able to listen to some of it um i i enjoyed every bit that i could hear um thanks to bright blue and the gulbenkian foundation uh fantastic uh, uh, uh fringe event on a very important subject um quite a lot more work to be done now i've got to mention that uh, bright blue has got another 15 fringe events that they're holding throughout party conference the next one is tomorrow at 10 30 caroline noakes and sarah sands on diversity in parliament uh, and you can join bright blue but that's not really my uh, job you can go on their website and uh, sign up but it's a very good uh, very good organization thank you very much for joining thank us you. and thank you everyone thank you goodbye thank you